people who want to join from there can also come. So uh, without further delays, I, uh, I'm going to hand over to Misha. Misha is going to tell us about exploring new scientific pr frontiers with programmable quantum simulators. Uh, any further questions about the sessions, um, I will answer at 11. Okay, so Nisha, please. Thank you very much, Una, for, for the kind introduction and for organizing the school. So, uh, so I will, what I will do today probably will be a bit of a change of pace. So I will actually talk about um, efforts uh, building a new kind of uh, new kind of machine, new kinds of machines. Um, basically, the the you know quantum computers and and simulators. But I hope I can make some connection to what was discussed in other sessions. And actually, honestly, uh, this is a field which is progressing very rapidly. So I actually hope that in that kind of in connection to the previous statement about hands-on session that maybe. If there will be a school next year, you know, part of what I will be talking about will be a parts of, you know, part of, could be a part of hands-on session where you can basically kind of connect to such a machine um, and, you know, really explore and kind of, you know, play with that. And, you know, so I think that's a kind of a new kid on a block, basically. That's my message. But let's start from the beginning. So what I will tell you uh, is... Uh, part of the worldwide wide kind of effort now, uh, which I sometimes call a quest for controlling quantum world. And in this quest, what we're trying to do is isolate and control simple quantum objects, like single electrons, single uh, spins, or single atoms in our case, and then build more and more complex systems from them. And then what we hope to do with these systems is to basically first explore new physics, and that means creating and probing new uh, entangled uh, quantum states of matter, and also explore new applications and applications such as quantum processing, communication, and uh, metrology. So this is very exciting field. There is a lot going on, but there are two big questions this field is facing. So one of them is how to build truly large scale quantum systems. You know, the systems consisting of you know, thousands or millions of, of good qubits. And then the second question is that, you know, uh, you know, once we build them, you know, what can we really do with them? So how to apply them to achieve useful quantum advantage? So, I mean, both of these questions <clears throat> are being actively explored, but it's fair to say that we are kind of still in the early stages of understanding the answers to both of them. So the kind of, uh, in, in practice, this um, uh, kind of effort, essentially involves uh, fighting two contradictory forces of uh, nature. So one is the, uh, the kind of the challenge of controllability. So we would like to build quantum systems of increasing size, but we still can really fully control the dynamics and you know, basically the use of laws uh, of quantum mechanics. But another one is scalability. So we'd like to have a lot of these systems. And, Typically, once your system becomes you know, big enough, it becomes very, very hard to control. So it's true for all um, areas of human activities, but actually it's also true in quantum me uh, me uh, mechanics and in, in quantum information. And the current frontier is we'd like to really build systems big enough that, uh, that really you know, you know, dramatically outperform the possibilities of conventional classical machines. And typically this would involve, you know, uh, systems with 100 or, or more qubits. And, you know, using those, what we are trying to do is build yet bigger and yet better quantum machines and then start kind of approaching these questions of useful algorithms and, you know, uh, scientific applications. And what I hope to convince you is that actually we are kind of now entering what I call an edge of quantum discovery. So this is kind of an error where we can already use these machines to start Kind of make scientific discoveries, and I will, you know, maybe mention some some of these things uh, along these lines. So basically, this is my plan for today. So I will first <clears throat> tell you about how actually ingredients of these machines, you know, how we build them, and then you know, focus kind of closer to the subject of the school and ideas of probing uh, quantum dynamics of many body systems, and um, uh, including uh, quantum phases and phase transitions in two D, and then talk towards the end maybe about some of our more recent work 
involving uh, realization of topological spin liquid uh, and you know our work on quantum optimization. So you will see there will be a connection, you know, a little bit to kind of machine learning and the big data in both of the subjects from different perspectives. Okay, so <clears throat> in our approach, <clears throat> we will build quantum processors uh, using individual cold neutral atoms. So why do we uh, pick the system is because these those uh, 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 systems have uh, very special properties. So actually they have, you know, truly excellent coherence properties uh, in terms of the isolation can be considered as the best uh, uh, kind of nature made qubits. <clears throat> and it's easy to create a large number of these uh, uh, of this, uh, atoms. In fact, in our rooms, in each of our rooms, there is a lot of there are a lot of atoms and molecules flying around. But there are also challenges. And first off, the atoms in a gas phase interact very weakly with each other. And second, um, uh, the neutral atoms are very hard to control individually, at least, uh, at least in large numbers. So basically, in all of these atoms and molecules which fly around us, it potentially is a material to create a huge quantum computer. But of course, there is no hope to track even one single atom uh, in, in this kind of system. So to address this challenge, uh, we uh, uh, use the approach where we basically build quantum systems atom by atom, literally. So in this approach, what we do is we start with the uh, uh, low pressure gas in the vacuum chamber and uh, uh, shine light on it. And basically what light does, it basically slows them down. We use this um, uh, uh, so-called laser cooling uh, techniques to slow them down and then after that, what we do, we sh shine into this vacuum chamber, the focused beams of light, like the one shown here. And uh, what is focused beams of light, they basically, you know, uh, attract any dielectric object to the point of highest intensity. So this uh, 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 form the so-called optical tweezers. So basically these optical tweezers, you know, tend to attract the objects to the focal point. And uh, what we do in our work is we focus these optical tweezers very, very tightly, such that uh, inside this optical tweezer, we can fit at most one atom. So what it kind of means is that if there are, for example, two atoms, you know, confined so tightly, what they do is they basically undergo kind of a collision and get ejected. So basically, in reality, what will happen that we will uh, uh, end up with the tweezers, which will be either filled by one atom or empty. And so what we do in our experiments, we start not just with one tweezer, but with many, typically hundreds of thousands, and then try to load them all. And then what happens is that on each given attempt, we end up with the configuration like this, when you know uh, some tweezers are loaded with one atom and some are empty. So to get rid, to, to kind of, you know, so, so the system has some disorder, has some uh, entropy. So to kind of uh, eliminate this entropy, to get rid of entropy, we use the following trick. So what we do is we simply take a picture of atoms, figure out which traps are full and which are empty, and then basically remove the empty traps and then rearrange the rest of the traps in the desired configuration. And so with that kind of approach, what uh, we end up, we end up with the atoms which are basically uh, kind of perfectly ordered. So, it, you know, you know, perfectly ordered arrays and they're typically spaced by distances of a couple of micrometers. So at this point, everything is completely classical. These atoms do not talk to each other. The interaction between them is negligible. So to enable the interaction, what we do, we excite the atoms in the Rydberg states. And so this uh, uh, excitation actually, as you will see in a, in a second, really enables very strong um, uh, and controlled uh, interaction. This is actually our effort, kind of joint, exper uh, joint experimental effort with collaboration with Markus Greiner and Vlad Mulitic, my uh, colleagues at Harvard and MIT. So let me just, uh, so I guess, you know, they have kind of, kind of a mixed group of, you know, some are kind of have more background in physics and some are less. So maybe I'll just briefly talk about what these kind of Rydberg atoms are. So, so if you take, for example, a you know hydrogen atom or hydrogen-like atom and and uh, put it uh, in a highly excited state, the state with high principal quantum number. So what happens is that in this state, uh, the 
atom size draws dramat uh, dramatically. So basically, if you put, for example, if you excite atom uh, to uh, the state with n equals uh, 100, so its size becomes basically a fraction of, of a micrometer. You know, And so this kind of uh, uh, large size, of course, results in a very large polarizability. So if you apply electric field, so this orbit will be easily deformed. And actually, as a consequence of all of that, you know, if you bring two atoms like this together, they start in, interact with uh, to interact with enormous strength. You know, with the uh, interaction strength which scales as eleventh power of principal quantum number. And for example, for n equals hundred, this interaction is fourteen orders of magnitude stronger than the interaction between ground state atoms. So this fourteen orders of magnitude is a large number, and I think we can really kind of. Uh, make you good use of that. So basically, uh, this is the interaction that we, that we will be using. And um, uh, uh, we will be using it in this very special way. And it involves the idea of a so-called Rydberg blockade, so which I will try to explain uh, here at least kind of briefly. So the idea is the following. So what we'll do in uh, these experiments, we will be exciting the atoms into the Rydberg states uh, using a resonant um, uh, kind of narrow band uh, light. So we'll just try to drive this ground to Rydberg state transitions. And if this transition is, these atoms are very far away from each other, then what will happen is that they will just undergo independent radio oscillations. They will be excited and be excited independently. But if we bring them closer together, then what happened is that you know, the uh, interaction between atoms at some point will kind of uh, take over and, um, you know, pass certain distance between atoms. So this kind of doubly excited state will be shifted way out of resonance. And so if you still use resonant light, then, in, you know, what you will be able to do, you will be able to excite one atom or another, but never both. So that's the idea of the Rydberg blockade, that simultaneous excitation of atom is blocked at distances smaller than this characteristic radius, Rydberg blockade. And it turns out to be a very, very good, very efficient, very robust um, ways to uh, um, uh, control atoms, to entangle them, to carry out quantum logic operations, and so on. And the reason for that is simply is that once you under well under this condition of this Rydberg blockade, so this kind of interaction is insensitive to motion and position of atoms. And basically, this blockade radius is actually highly tunable. So it can be you know, chosen by choosing, for example, uh, the principal quantum number and, and things like this. And basically, you know, it can range from you know, a few microns to almost like 100 microns, depending on values. So in short, here is what we will be doing. So we'll be assembling, basically, from scratch, a desired system, desired configuration of atoms. And then we will subject these atoms to a sequences of laser pulses. And then basically at the end, we will just, you know, read out the uh, uh, state. We'll do projective read out of the state. So, um, now this is a kind of an overall approach of course in practice you know uh, you, you have a lot of choice you can you know choose the atom you want to use and you know it could be either alkali atom hydrogen like atom or some of the recent experiment you use alkaline earth atoms we can also encode qubit um, in these atomic states you know in different ways so atoms have a lot of different internal structure and one can really utilize it so the simplest um, uh, qubit in the approach I just described could be just one selected state of the ground state manifold and one selected state of Rydberg state. Uh, or alternatively, we could use two hyperfine qubits in the ground state and just you know pick one of the uh, of those hyperfine qubits and excite them in the Rydberg state when we want atoms to interact. So basically, what you see is that you know this now kind of allows you to start kind of engineering. The system <clears throat> and these are all control knobs to basically to do this engineering. So in this uh, um, lecture I will focus mostly on application of these kind of systems to the idea of programmable quantum simulators and this was the kind of uh, very original idea which uh, led Feynman to kind of start uh, to start thinking about quantum computers to begin with and so in particular, what you know, he uh, kind of noticed in this very famous paper is that if you just want to, for example, model um, 
uh, you know, exactly quantum dynamics of uh, n interacting systems, this will generally require a solution of at least two to the n uh, uh, coupled equations. And, you know, this becomes very prohibitive when n is around 50 or so, uh, actually sometimes a little bit smaller. So, and um, uh, what he pointed out is that the alternative approach could be to implement uh, a kind of a quantum simulator, including sender sets of qubits uh, or quantum systems with programmable interaction and just, you know, use it to kind of simulate uh, the dynamics. And that's exactly what we will be doing in, in our approach. So actually, it turns out that like, uh, you know, last week was for some reason, I actually read some of this uh, uh, Feynman's original papers and actually what is kind of really striking is that in when he was started thinking about this quantum computers um, uh, and, and quantum simulators, uh, it turns out he it looks like at least he literally was thinking about the approach that we are kind of pursuing. So because he basically, you know, like that's a, that's a quote. He says that you know you can start uh, computing device when the numbers are represented by row of atoms, each of them in I in I of two states. That's an input, then Hamiltonian starts, and then um, uh, um, some atoms uh, kind of uh, read out. Uh, nothing could be made smaller, nothing could be made more elegant. So that's the approach which we are pursuing. Okay, so to be kind of more a little bit, you know, uh, specific and more kind of technical. So let's uh, consider now an array, a string of one atoms. So first one dimensional system. And uh, 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 positioned, for example, let's assume that they are uh, 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 their positions, uh, the position equidistance equidistantly, so it, it's a regular one-dimensional array. And let's kind of uh, ask a question: What kind of systems can we in practice, uh, 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 you know, simulate? And so, um, uh, so this actually is effective Hamiltonian, which describes this the system which I outlined. So it has uh, three terms. One of them is a laser driving. So this is a Rabi oscillation term. This is a laser detuning, uh, which basically here acts kind of as a chemical potential. So N is number of Rydberg atoms on each side. So it's zero if atom is in a ground state and one if atom is in a Rydberg state. And then this is the interaction term. So to get the feel for this kind of model, you know, for the physics which we can study, let's ask about the ground state of this Hamiltonian. And actually, this ground state has been studied already quite some time ago. So this ground, this ground state, I would like to characterize in terms of two variables. One of them is a laser detuning, that's this chemical potential term, and another one is interaction range, the range of Rydberg blockade. So if there are no interactions, so what will happen is that you know basically everything will be determined by this laser detuning, the phase diagram. So if this detuning is negative then it favors all ends to be zero, all atoms in the ground state. The tuning is positive, you know, basically it favors all atoms to be in the excited state. But of course, a state like that is incompatible with Rydberg blockade. So if our Rydberg blockade just involves nearest neighbor, effective nearest neighbor uh, blockade interactions, then uh, uh, if I try to maximize the number of atoms, I cannot, you know, put all atoms in the ground state, but I can put every other atom. So then there will be the state up, down, up, down, up, down. So this is a state where with G2 uh, symmetry broken. So it's basically anti-ferromagnetic or nail state. Uh, but of course, you know, you can now, you know, tune your blockade, you can increase interaction range. And for example, if <clears throat> two near, uh, nearest neighbors are blockaded, then you will break the free symmetry. And then you know, if you proceed, you break Z4 symmetry, etc. So that's kind of, you know, intuitive um, uh, explanation of this uh, phase diagram. So basically to uh, explore this phase diagram experimentally, what we can do, we can just start with all atoms in the ground state and uh, set the interaction range and then just try to change this laser detuning, change the chemical potential. And so that way we can actually really hope that we can really cross the phase transition and enter these other phases. And it is indeed what happens. So this is an example a small system, relatively small systems of 13 atoms. So basically, you know, uh, here, you know, if the atoms um, uh, uh, are sufficiently far away that only kind of nicks, uh, only nearest neighbor is blockaded, you enter this C2 phase, this up, down, up, down phase. So basically to kind of increase the effective interaction range, what you do is just bring the atoms closer together. And, you know, as shown here, and then 
you know, every third atom is excited. And then, you know, if you bring them even closer and every fourth atom is excited. So basically what you see here in this very simple example is how by programming interactions, by choosing the atom position, the choosing the interaction strength, we can really kind of, you know, change the symmetry that we break kind of, so we, you know, enter different uh, states. And uh, basically this kind of simple example really illustrates the power of this approach. So over the last um, uh, few years, what we have done is we can we actually use it for very different applications. And I will be talking about some of them. So we have created high fidelity entanglement and uh, used this interaction to do parallel multi-qubit gate operations. So we studied quantum phase transitions in this one dimensional array. We studied uh, dynamics and actually that's the area we made some first uh, discoveries, uh, kind of discovered this class of phenomena called quantum many body scars. Uh, and we also used it to engineer entanglement. So for example, if uh, for the array with odd number of atoms, if you kind of make a transition into this antiferromagnetic state, into Z2 state, you actually create a superposition of up, down, up, down, up, down, and down, up, down, up. So that's kind of, uh, uh, you can use it to generate, for example, a GHG state. So uh, these directions are very closely connected. So uh, they all involve coherent high fidelity analog or digital um, uh, evolution. So in what follows, I will tell you a little bit more about some of our recent work uh, in this area, but maybe this is a good point now that to stop and see if there are any questions, because this was a kind of a background uh, material, which I would like to. Right, so there, there is a question from Rahul Sani. Um, does even odd number of atoms presence affect the ZN ordering in your results? I think that was like previous slide. Yes, yes, so it, it actually does. And um, so in the, on the previous slide, we can also look at, so for example, this is, mm -hmm. so here, you know, this is an array of 51 atoms. And what happens here, if you are perfectly adiabatic, you will actually create this state up, down, up, down, up, down. So you, you create one specific state. However, and, and this is the case for the odd atom array. However, if the number is even, then you have two degenerate states, right? So basically, you know, you have the state up, down, up, down, up, down, and down, up, down, down, up. And so basically what happens here, you really have a kind of true symmetry breaking in the sense that, you know, um, you know, even in the, for the ground state, you, you are expected to have ideally a superposition, a cat state. This is a cat state here we demonstrated. So indeed, so there are basically kind of, uh, so here is, you know, a, a large number of states and there are two states really, you know, dominant, right? There are these two states and actually moreover, we showed that we can preserve a coherence, preserve a phase between them. That's how we show that we have an entangled state. Uh, I have a question. Um, in when you quoted Feynman, you know he talked about using the Hamiltonian to do the time evolution. Yeah. So, um, uh, can you observe the like real time evolution? Is that how you study non equilibrium dynamics? That is exactly right. Yes. Yeah. So what we I do? See. Yeah. So I mean, we actually all of our experiments are basically time evolution. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so th these experiments. Uh, which, which I described here, where we do these mm -hmm. adiabatic sweeps, mm -hmm. they actually also time evolution. It's just sometimes mm -hmm. we are trying to evolve, you know, slowly that we mm -hmm. actually try to stay close to the ground state, right? That's mm -hmm. and this is really an this what you see here is a result, you know, is a result of that. So you change the detuning mm -hmm. slowly, past mm -hmm. a certain in, up to a certain point, and then make a measure. And what so mm -hmm. you see, for example, here you really see the kind of toy picture of phase transition. There are two states, mm -hmm. all atoms in the ground state and this ordered state, they are really here, they are fighting, you know, for, for mm -hmm. life, you know, they are fighting with, with, with each other, right? You know, so here there are two other states. So basically what you see is all of these different kind of, you know, it's, it's a real kind of, it's all of these experiments are dynamics basically, right? Um, and, and from the, so I, I guess like you cannot define temperature because this is not in equilibrium, right? It is in an interesting, exactly. So mm -hmm. indeed, you know, it is isolated system. We work very hard mm -hmm. to keep mm -hmm. it isolated. Mm -hmm. So the only way how you can define the temperature 
is in a sense of this um, uh, eigenstate formalization hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Right. So you basically mm -hmm. the system should formalize kind mm -hmm. of itself. And that's mm -hmm. actually that's kind of the examples of um where you're studying these dynamics is extremely interesting. And mm -hmm. this is kind of, I would say, a very fruitful kind of uh you know ground for really for discovery. Because every time we did the experiment where, for example, we tried to kind of you know deviate a little bit from adiabaticity you know we would see mm -hmm. something new and unexpected and so for example this mm -hmm. one i don't really yeah, plan to talk too much about these quantum mm -hmm. scars today but i mean mm -hmm. i could you know, but, but so basically this is the first experiment where we you know saw examples so basically here what we do is we first adiabatically prepare this up down up down up down state mm -hmm. and then but instead of stopping then we quench mm. the detuning just across the phase transition. Mm. And then what this was really kind of the very first, among the very first time our experiment started to work with say, okay, why don't we see how rapidly the system formalize? Mm. What we see here is actually does formalize initially, but then if you wait mm. a little bit longer, mm. so the order reappears. Mm. And it disappears again, and re mm. it reappears again. So this is what mm. this kind of quantum scars, and it turns out only special, so this is not a, an integrable system. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that only very special states undergo these dynamics, you know, so it's mm -hmm. that's what, mm -hmm. uh, but so basically this kind of example illustrates the, the power of this approach. We can study mm -hmm. all of, we can go to corners of Hilbert space in this way mm -hmm. no one has ever been to, you know. Mm -hmm. so. But in, in trying to compare to like the conventional, um, you know, thinking, the way yeah. we think about um, equilibrium, like Hamiltonian, right? Because you mm -hmm. engineer a Hamiltonian. When we think about Hamiltonian, we think, think about what is, the, you know, are we in the ground state? Are we in the excited yeah. state? What yeah. is the nature of the ground state? Yeah. So trying to connect your experiment to that kind of Hamiltonian thinking and that equilibrium step map, we would have to decide, am I trying to look for the ground state in the, in the data? Or am I trying to look for you know, excited state in the data. And I guess the answer is that I should try to look for ground states. Well, it, uh, I mean, it depends, right? It depends mm -hmm. on what, so, I mean, in many experiments, we actually are trying to prepare ground states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, um, and then this comparison with ground state could be kind of a mm -hmm. good benchmark. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in, in a big system, you know, what, you know, what in practice we will see is that, you know, we don't always, on, not on every shot we will prepare because we go with mm -hmm. finite speed and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the state which we create, we can compare with thermal state. We can assign mm -hmm. the, the temperature, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, mm -hmm. it sometimes would work, but, you know, more mm -hmm. often than not, it wouldn't. You know? so, mm -hmm. so that's a very interesting mm -hmm. kind of, it's a very interesting challenge. So to really, mm -hmm. to really kind of compare it with numerics, you have to, you know, do dynamics technically. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, there's a question. Is the in, as the interaction is related to distance between atoms, is phonon-like terms take part? Is what sorry? Phonon. Phonon-like. Uh, phonon. Yeah. Term. Well. Yeah. That's um, a very good question. So basically, to the leading order, we do not have phonons. Mm. Right. So. Because the atoms uh, do not move basically on a time scale when we do these experiments. Um, we can try to engineer. So, you know, sometimes we, you know, under certain conditions, we could see small kind of amount of dephasing due to kind of atomic motion. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, typically this is an unwanted effect. So, I mean, that's why we cool atoms, you know, that's why we trap mm -hmm. them. But, you know, I think one could also turn this question around and, and say, can you engineer the phonons mm -hmm. here? And actually, mm -hmm. it turns out mm -hmm. that you can, you know, mm -hmm. you can sort of have additional control knobs. You can create this mm -hmm. kind of little, kind, you know, and so this is actually an interesting direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but technically, all right. So maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was all the questions. Maybe we can continue on now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I would like now to kind of, focus a little bit more on a recent work that we have done. So about two years ago, uh, we actually have um, embarked upon a major rebuild of the, of the experiment. And we are now running this uh, 
what we call um, uh, uh, you know generation two to this array. So this is a powered by this device, which is called spatial lighter uh, modulator. So basically, this is a computer generated hologram, which takes as an input laser, a laser beam, and you know upon reflection, you basically can create you know almost an arbitrary array of of the uh, of the um, uh, of the patterns, light pattern. And so when you focus it on the in a vacuum chamber, you can easily see this kind of. Uh, 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 system of you know over a thousand of, of tweezers. So um uh actually can I just just one second? I'm so so sorry. So just one second. Uh just one second. I'm so I'm so sorry. Can you wait for like half an hour? Of course. Of course. I, I, I sincerely apologize. <laughs> so anyway, so these are, I hope you enjoyed, had a chance to enjoy this, uh, you know. So this is basically over thousands of traps. Now this, this uh, traps um, uh, are typically static. So to move atoms between these traps, we use the second channel and we use two uh, crossed acousto-optic deflectors. So this uh, basically, this acousto-optic deflector is a, kind of is a device which is used often in a, as a barcode scanner in the supermarket. And uh, basically, you know, the, you know, and we use this two of them to move atoms in rows and columns. So in this all computer control. And then actually, one other thing which actually was a kind of a landmark or kind of a milestone for this experiment is that um, basically about a year ago, you know, we had to kind of leave our labs, you know, during the lockdown and actually in a week leading to that, we converted this experiment completely into remote operation. So from what follows, all what I'll show you are the data taken remotely, right? And it kind of bodies well for the next year, you know, hands-on session, hopefully, you know, for, for school participants. But anyway, so these are the kinds of um, arrays which we can create, you know, you can create all sorts of uh, uh, ordered pattern, but we can also, you know, create a random pattern. So for example, here is arbitrary, you know, kind of field uh, uh, randomly generated uh, pattern of, of like sub, sub lattice of a, uh, a subset of square array. And actually we can just program it. And, you know, here is a picture of atoms. So basically, you know, we can uh, right now work with systems up to about 300 sorted atoms, you know, and, you know, okay, there are some imperfections. We are working to improve with them, but, you know, it kind of, as you will see, it starts to work reasonably well. So basically, okay, what kind of phases can we now ex uh, explore? So uh, this is again uh, our Hamiltonian uh, with the storms, which we already discussed. But now we have a two-dimensional pattern. So, uh, and uh, if you have just nearest neighbor interaction, then uh, what will happen is that uh, 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 you know, you will create like an analog of antiferromagnetic phase in two dimensions. So basically, that will be kind of the situation. So this phase, you know, if you kind of paint it correctly, look here exactly like a checkerboard. So we can call it a checkerboard phase. So uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, kind of antiferromagnetic or NEL or checkerboard phase, you know, is connected to the trivial phase with the uh, by two, two uh, by Ising phase transitions and in two dimensions, it has been you know very well studied. But actually, if you now start increasing, for example, a range of the uh, uh, interaction potential, then it turns out that there is a whole zoo of different phases. So atoms tend to order in kind of different you know highly non-trivial ways. And actually, there's also quite complex phase diagram here, depending on the, for example. Lindbergh blockade radius and, and delta. And actually, by now we have studied most, we have realized and studied most of these phases on this on this uh, uh, phase diagram. So it's actually you know quite cool and exciting. But even actually it turns out, even this kind of simplest transition in the checkerboard phase, this 2D or 2 plus 1 D ising quantum phase transition has never been observed up to now. So let's see what we can do about it. So, uh, you know, to basically, you know, study it, we arrange the atoms in this pattern uh, square lattice array. 
uh, such that only nearest neighbor undergo the blockade. And then what we do, we do just a diabatic sweep into this checkerboard. And then basically here is the final, uh, you know, one, you know, result of one experimental shot. So what you see, you see basically this checkerboard pattern, you know, across the entire array. So this is, in this case, is a perfect ground state, you know, and uh, this is not what happened basically all the time. So, um, and in order to basically study this order, what you need to do, you need to look at, you know, things like correlation functions. So this is density density correlation function, and indeed it shows now this checkerboard pattern, you know, spread across the entire array. So we also can analyze this um, phase microscopically. And so we can, for example, look at you know what are what are the probabilities to for for every kind of microstate, you know, single individual microstate to occur. And actually, it turns out that the highest probable states are the states shown here and the complementary state, which is basically where you kind of move the uh, the pattern just by one uh, lattice site. And, you know, so basically, you know, you can also ask what's the probability that you, you create this ground state. And so actually you can sort of use it, you know, to estimate the entropy and then temperature of the system. And what you see is that this probability actually goes down with increasing system size. Uh, but, you know, it goes down as a kind of uh, following this um, law 0.97 to the power of n. So there's basically 3% of error per atom. Uh, and, you know, I think this basically allows us to benchmark the system. So that way we kind of, if we try to do most adiabatic, this 3% includes everything. Imperfect preparation, non-adiabatic effects, the residual quantum fluctuations and everything. So basically to now study the quantum phase transition, what we do is we use dynamics. And basically in this kind of uh, uh, experiment, uh, what we do is we uh, go across the phase transition with different speed. And we use something which is called quantum kibble zurich uh, mechanism, which basically connects dynamics to kind of universal scaling exponents. So specifically the way how this uh, specific experiment works is that depending on the speed with which we go, we create different um, range of correlations, right? So basically if we go very fast, we, we only, you know, create correlations across small, you know, groups of nearest neighbors. But if we go very slow, we create correlations across the entire lattice. And so you can extract from here the correlation length and basically plot it, you know, as a function of speed and as a function of where you stop. And what you see is that these curves are all very different. And uh, then in order to, basically understand the nature of this phase transition, what we do is we uh, uh, do kind of scaling an analysis. So specifically, we rescale all of these quantities, correlation length, effective detuning by the speed S with which we go across a phase transition. And then uh, for basically second order phase transition, the universality theory, the universal behavior predicts that all of these curves should, should collapse upon proper rescaling. And the only things which can which control this rescaling will be these two critical exponent, this new uh, correlation length critical exponent and Z dynamical critical exponent. And so here, uh, you know, what we do is we do this kind of data collapse and you see indeed these curves, uh, curves you know, collapse on each other. and from here, we can actually extract these critical exponents. And in fact, you know, we can optimize this collapse. And it turns out that these critical exponents, which we extract are indeed very much consistent with what's expected for the quantum phase transition, uh, for Ising quantum phase transition in two plus one dimension. So not only we can study this um, uh, uh, phenomena, this uh, quantum critical uh, phenomena, but it's also, uh, it serves as a benchmark of how quantum or how coherent our system is. Because for example, a thermal phase transition, you know, or if you had, you know, basically if your system would be connected to the buff, we would get very different critical exponents from here. So this kind of, again, this gives you a little bit of flavor, hopefully the kind of uh, 
you know, capabilities, you know, the kind of things which we do with our system. And then actually over the last year or so, we enjoyed um, kind of playing with that in different variety uh, of ways. So for example, we have been uh, kind of exploring these more complicated states in this two-dimensional phase diagram. So we studied a lot this non-equilibrium dynamics. And actually we have, for example, shown that these many body scars can be stabilized by driving, by periodic driving in a quite non-trivial way. Um, and uh, we also uh, explored topological phases and uh, we also want to use this machine as a computational tool to test combinatorial optimization. So I think these are all kind of uh, cool directions, but maybe before, and I will maybe just give one example, I'll maybe briefly talk about spin liquids, but before that, let me just pause here and ask if there are, if there are any questions about what I just said. So um, Ivan is asking, what is the set of observables that are experimentally accessible? So uh, in the experiment, we can basically measure the entire wave, wave function in a given basis, mm -hmm. right? You know, so uh, in this, in what I showed, uh, kind of all, all of these pictures here, right? They are basically the pictures where we take a snapshot of atom and. Uh, in the kind of in the z basis, if you want, you know, in a basis, you know, atom up or atom down, and you know, and then we get in this basis, we get all information that you can possibly get about the state. We could also rotate a basis and then make us, you know, make a measurement in this basis. And what in what I will show you now, it, this is something that what we do. And so from here, you can basically try to evaluate any any quantity, you know, local observable, global observable, you know, any, anything. All right. Are there any other questions? No. I think we can move on, continue on. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah, so, yeah, okay. So let me, I will just uh, talk about one example of the recent work in which we realized and, and probe this kind of uh, uh, elusive uh, uh, quantum spin liquid states. Okay, so first off, what is that? So <clears throat> this quantum spin liquid is a, is a form of topological kind of special form of matter, which was postulated by P.W. Anderson a, lo a long time ago, uh, uh, basically almost 50 years ago. And uh, the essence of these topological phases is that they should be characterized by some kind of topological observable. So locally, if you look at these phases, there should be nothing special about them, but actually you should not reveal any order. But you know, once you start looking for something which has some topological kind of character, you should be able to see this order. So uh, these um, uh, phases were long predicted to occur in this kind of frustrated lattices. So one simplest you know, paradigmatic example of frustrated lattice is this triangular lattice uh, with, for example, anti-ferromagnetic interaction. So if you take two spins and put this one up and this one down, you, don't, you wouldn't know where to put the third spin here, up or down, you know, because it's you know, frustrated. So, uh, and basically kind of motivated by this consideration, you know, the work over, past 40 years have really kind of pushed this, you know, subject along different ways. So in particular, you know, the kind of popular uh, class of models which uh, emerged uh, is the so-called class of so-called dimer models, where you basically, um, you know, in this kind of case, what, you know, one possible phase which could occur is that, you know, these nearby spins, they form basically entangled like singlet states. And they, these single states are kind of bonds uh, and then, or dimers. And then what happens is that, you know, basically you end up with all of these kind of singlets, you know, covering, you know, their entire uh, lattice. But of course, there are many ways how these dimers can kind of arrange. And so that kind of creates something which is called uh, 
uh, uh, a resonant balance bond state, RVB state, where basically all of these kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of configurations kind of resonate. And so this uh, spin liquid is basically supposed to be a superposition kind of, ma of massively degenerate states of this, of this time. So this work has been extremely influential and actually about 20 years ago, it has been kind of you know, amplified. This interest has been amplified by realization that such states could be used as a basis for fault tolerant quantum computation. And this is the famous story code, Kitai story code state. So basically to kind of, the, you know, again, this is a kind of state where local observables cannot, you know, reveal any order. But, you know, if you start looking at kind of uh, topological observables, such as this kind of closed string operators, you can, you know, start seeing the emergence of this order. So despite this kind of excitement, you know, in this field, there is no conclusive experimental evidence of such states in any system today. So let's kind of see if we can uh, address this challenge. And so in order to do that, we use um, our Rydberg atom array, and we adjust Rydberg blockade radius uh, 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 for atoms which are placed on the links of this Kagame lattice. And we adjust this blockade radius in such a way that each Rydberg atoms has six nearest neighbor blockaded, like shown here. So in this case, the maximal filling you should be able to create is one quarter. And uh, it turns out that this type of uh, model can be mapped into the dimer model, where you basically associate a dimer with each Rydberg atoms, uh, uh, at atom which lives on a link. So this is an example, for example, of a dimer configuration corresponding to this uh, 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 atom arrangement. And the prediction uh, from the theoretical papers, actually, this was a, a theory work by, done by uh, Subir Sajdev group, and in particular Ashwin Vishwanath's group <clears throat> for this specific la lattice. So is that uh, basically the, we should be able to create this quantum spin liquid state, which is basically a superposition of all of these dimer coverings. Well, okay, how can we do it? <clears throat> we start with uh, a lattice now, which has uh, 219 atoms, <clears throat> and they live here on a on, they are placed, <coughs> sorry, on the uh, links <coughs> of this uh, Kagame lattice. Then we engineer the interaction between them and do kind of adiabatic evolution and, you know, take a snapshot. And this is one example of the, you know, what you see here. You basically, there is no obvious ordering at all. So basically, how can we detect and study this topological order? So in order to do that, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, look at few observables. One observable is this um, average occupation number. And what you see is that, you know, something happens near quarter or one quarter filling. There is a kind of a little bit of plateauing effect, but it's not very dramatic. So it's very hard to actually um, uh, make any predictions or any conclusions based on these measurements. Instead, what we can do is we can try to study this topological string operators. So these are the string operators, which one should look at in the toric code. So what uh, we are doing here is something you know, very similar, but also a little bit different. So let me just explain it first on the uh, example, on the example of this diagonal string um, operator Z. So this diagonal string operator is, is the, uh, the following. So if you take a loop which goes perpendicular to the uh, uh, kind of to the links of the Skagame lattice and uh, look at the parity of all, you know, basically atoms, you know, kind of a Z, you know, product of sigma Z operators for all atoms here. Then <clears throat> uh, it turns out that it, this parity should be well-defined in this kind of, you know, valid dimer covering. And the reason is the following. So basically, for the perfect dimer covering, every vertex of Kagame lattice should be touched by one dimer, exactly by one dimer. So basically, if you go around just one vertex, the expectation value of this parity should be minus one. So it's actually kind of like a Gauss law. So if you basically now uh, draw the bigger loop, so then the parity should be minus one to the power of enclosed number of vertices. And you know, so basically, 
This is a characteristic feature of this kind of dimer uh, coverings of the dimer ordering. And indeed, when we make this, you know, uh, when we look at these observables, we indeed see that once we approach this one quarter filling, we start seeing this kind of dimer order appearing, you know, so it actually exists up to, you know, even for quite large loops. But, you know, what you see here is that, of course, it, it's kind of well it decays as we go to larger and larger loops. So basically, this kind of string operators reveal transition into this uh, dimer phase. Now, to really prove that you have um, a superposition of these dimer coverings, you have to uh, dig deeper and you have to look at off diagonal string operators. And so, these off diagonal string operators for this model, they are basically defined you know, uh, as, as follows. So, if you just act on one of the um, uh, edges of this, for example, you know, uh, of the link, um, then it should basically flip these uh, dimers around. And this is a loop, loop, this is a rule how this flip actually, you know, um, occurs. And so basically, you know, with the operator defined in this way, so if you have a closed loop, then it turns out that this closed loop converts one dimer covering to another dimer covering. So, I know it's a little bit complicated, but you know this is just perfect. There is a perfect analogy to to a single qubit. You know, for a single qubit, if you want to detect the coherence between zero and one, you need to measure sigma x. You basically need to measure the operator which flips you from zero to one, and this is exactly what this of diagonal string operator does. So it turns out we can measure it, and the way how we measure it, we convert this x string into the z string through the kind of dynamical manipulation of the system by doing this kind of short quench or more precisely uh, rotation, which is rotates within this kind of free atom, uh, you know, subspace. And indeed we see this revival of the parity and basically the, uh, in this way we see that we observe coherence between diver coverings again across a large fraction of the array. So how can we reveal the topological properties of, 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 of the system? So in order to do that, we should really compare closed loops versus open strings. And uh, here the effect is quite dramatic. So once we enter this dimer phase, you know, for example, a Z closed loop goes exactly to zero, but the open loop, uh, sorry, the open loop goes exactly to zero and closed loop has a finite signal. Likewise, in X, you know, the X uh, open loop goes, you know, exactly to zero around delta or omega, kind of close to three, and then you have a finite signal still for the for the closed loop. And so, basically, one can formalize this kind of um, uh, considerations by looking for, you know, string order parameters, basically a kind of normalized open loop divided by closed loop, and Basically, that way you can distinguish, for example, spin liquid from trivial phase, from well it's bond phase, and indeed we find this kind of in this parameter domain around delta over omega over four, we find this, you know, um, uh, kind of a right behavior for this uh, BFFM uh, string order parameters, which basically indicates an onset of quantum spin liquid phase. So um, this is, uh, let me just skip a little bit. So this is actually quite exciting uh, kind of uh, time. And so basically, you know, um, this, uh, you know, kind of approach really allows quite unprecedented insights into this topological matter. And, you know, I think it's really a new tool, which is, you know, very much complementary to kind of both analytical theories and classical numerical simulations. So this is a kind of a picture, for example, from the, uh, scientific American 15 years ago, I think artists who drew this picture probably doesn't, didn't believe himself or herself that such a thing, you know, he for, they probably thought that this physicist say I'm, you know, crazy, you know, but I think this is now really possible. And basically this kind of the topological states now be, can be controlled using basically these laser beams, which can poke around and move um, uh, these excitations. And actually this is also a very nice example where you know, kind of big data and the quantum simulators really should kind of work together, because you know, as I already indicated, the states are very hard to actually not just produce but also you know uh, characterize. And for example, one 
think that what we are now doing is we're using this technique, which we actually proposed a couple of years ago called quantum uh, convolutional neural network. So it's actually a quantum extension of, of conventional CNN, uh, which is actually a combination of quantum error correction and, and, and something called MERA, uh, multi-scale entanglement renormalization. And that's to really analyze the states and understand, you know, kind of their nature and, um, and, 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 and things like this. So I think maybe given it's 10 o'clock, so perhaps it's a um, good time for me to uh, go towards the conclusion. So there are Uh, Misha, you're you're muted. Um, I don't know why, but Oops, sorry. So it's just okay. now. Yeah. 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 So this is a you know exciting kind of you know a field where there is a lot of physics which we can explore, but we are also improving our system. So we, for example, developing techniques now where we can rapidly you know control not just in preparation but during dynamic evolution individual atoms in parallel. So we are trying to include increase. Um, uh, 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 depth of the circuit. We're trying to network the system, but you know, I hope that you know I can really convince you that this is actually a very kind of fruitful, very exciting area where we can now use this platform to really start discovering new phases and analyzing uh, their behavior. So, uh, with that, I'd like to you know thank all people whose blood and sweat kind of resulted in this work, and you know, thank you also for your attention. And I hope I have maybe a few more minutes to answer questions. Okay, thank you. That was an awesome talk, I learned so much. <laughs> when we try to uh, have lectures that are designed to teach students, it becomes understandable <laughs> to me, so yeah. I end up learning. <laughs> okay, so there's a question. Um, can, you, uh, can the transport properties be measured? That's kind of, that's a very good question. And the answer is yes, but in an unusual way. So the way how we can measure transport properties is through kind of dynamics, right? By kind of creating certain type of excitation, for example, creating like a spin wave, you know, uh, and we could do it with a certain momentum and then just watch how the spin wave propagates. You know, that's the way how we can do it, you know. Or alternatively, you know, we can do, you know, things like that, you know, what I have, what I've shown, sorry, what I've shown, what I try to indicate here. So this is actually also kind of transport, right? Mm -hmm. So basically here, what you do, you kind of, with the laser beam, you kind of, for example, locally, you know, create kind of poke the hole and then you start moving these holes, right? This is also, this is, you know, that's kind of, of course, a braiding experiment, right? That was something we would like to do. Right. So um, following up on that, there was a question from, I think, YouTube live channel. There, we had limited space. So some people are following from YouTube. Um, can we see the non-trivial braiding between the topological excitations? Yes, that's, you know, yes. So we definitely would like to show that. So this is some of, some of the things we, have, we are working on. We already, you know, in our um, kind of work, which is now um, on archive, we already were kind of able to measure things like anion density and so on. So we could, we could extract it from measuring this topological, you know, loop for string of, of operators. But, you know, what we would really like to do now is we would like to, and actually, you know, one other thing that, that we have done, so I guess I didn't have really time to kind of talk about it, Oops, sorry, uh, is we have uh, created a kind of a baby version of topological qubit. And the way, you know, how we have done it is we basically created an array with a non-trivial topology. And, you know, so in here, it turns out that there are basically two, this, you know, this little, and the way how it's done is by just removing three atoms in the middle. So it's making a very small hole, which turns out it, gives, it divides this entire array into two topological sectors. So 
you know, one topological sector, you can basically transform states, transform dimers covering coverings from one to another by just local resonances like this. And these two, uh, and these two are different because you have to basically make a resonance around this hole. And it's a very high order effect. And so we were able to actually create superposition of these two types of um, uh, states. So it's, you know, it's nothing, you know, super kind of uh, in itself, you know, it, it's not a breaking, but, you know, we were able to create a superposition, you know, of these two states. And, you know, it is, you know, has some, you know, we are now exploring, for example, lifetime of this topological qubits and so on. But braiding experiment is definitely something we'd like to do. It, it's quite realistic. It just needs a little bit new upgrades and, you know, it just involves literally poking the holes and moving certain types of the holes around each other. All right. Um, maybe one last question. How do you determine the starting configuration of atom arrays when you vary um, n in the system, expectation value of n in the system? So uh, these n, you know, n is a number of Rydberg atoms. So right, that's actually almost like an emergent property so, of the system. So what we do in these experiments, so we fix the atom position. For example, what, what I, maybe it's a question about specifically this slide. So what we do is we fix the atom position here in this case of the link of the links of the Kagame uh, lattice. And then what we do is we change dynamically our laser intensity and detuning, right? And basically this, this, this feeling now is a uh, number of Rydberg atoms. It depends on the final value of the detuning in this sweep. Right, so depending when you stop this, you know, you kind of change the detuning and then at some point you stop and take a picture, right? So that's what controls it, right? Okay, one, well, I guess this is the very, very last question. Um, can you comment more on the nature of transition between different Z and states? Are they all smooth? Uh, anything look first order? Yes, so that's actually a very, very good question. So, and in fact, this is something that we are uh, um, uh, exploring now. So let me just be a little bit specific. So, so, so this is the phase diagram, which I guess this question refers to. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, so I mean, okay, so maybe when we talk about ZN, maybe. Perhaps the question was about one one D system, right? Yeah, I think so. I think so, okay. right? Because so, you had Z one, Z two, Z three, Z four. Yes, so, so. In, okay, so in one D system, you know, these transitions are, you know, most of them are second order. I mean, not all, uh, but actually, we have explored them. We had a nature paper in twenty nineteen, you know, where we explored them in great detail. Not only we have. Kind of, you know, you know, we studied basically we extracted critical exponents into transitions into Z3 state, which should be second order. Mm -hmm. But actually, even the transition into Z4 state, we were able to extract critical exponent, even though people don't are not sure whether it's a second order or first order. Mm -hmm. So, but so but most of these transitions are second order. So actually. Mm -hmm. What we are now doing, we are studying transitions, corresponding transitions into these uh, states of two-dimensional arrays. Mm -hmm. And they're actually quite interesting. So mm -hmm. the transition to checkerboard phase is a second order and we quantified it in our paper. So experimentally, we also saw transitions into the star and striated phase we did not quantify critical exponents, but you know, we were able, but they kind of looked experimentally, they looked smooth. And we initially thought that they are also second order transition. Our understanding is now evolving. And in particular, mm. it looks like this transitions, you know, into the straight and start phase might be actually a first order transitions. Mm. But what happens is that it turns out that the boundary effects play a big role. 
So kind of, I think the boundary effects here sort of almost dominate. And it's something that we are working on. It's, you know, stay tuned. So I think it's very, very interesting. They're very, very interesting. So um, offline, I should tell you about what um, Cool has found looking at the data okay. about the boundary okay. effect okay. and okay. also phases that were not identified before okay. using that's CCNN. Good. Yes, that's great. So, yes, yes, yes. All yes. right. So, yes. so with that, I think let's thank Michelle again. This was just very, very pedagogical and very helpful. I, I think it was really awesome. Super, super awesome. Thank you, yeah, so, thank much. you so much. Please, thank please you. send us the slides. Okay. Yes, I'll do that. Yes. Okay. All right. So now we're going to switch gears to continue with um, Andrew's uh, awesome lecture yesterday. Andrew Wilson is going to continue the uh, on with the second of his three lecture series. Um, Andrew, are you? I see I'm all you. Set. Yep. I'm here. Yeah, you're all yeah. set. Okay. Great. I'm going to start okay. sharing screen with the iPad if that works. Let's see. Okay. Okay. No, I need to meet meet a co-host. I think for that. Uh, Jonathan, can you make another version of Andrew um, co-host? Do we have both Andrews? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see. That work now. Great. Yep. So we're all set. All right. All right. Well, uh just continue uh, on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, and we'll just pick up exactly where we left off um, from last mm -hmm. time. So last time we introduced the probabilistic framework for model construction and building our training losses and thinking about concepts like overfitting, et cetera. We'll now exemplify some of these foundations um, showing quite a stark difference between classical training and Bayesian methods. And we'll use this to transition into some principles that we want to keep in mind when we're constructing new models. So we talked a lot about training losses and um, overfitting and stuff like this. We didn't fully resolve this question that we started with about how we can use the really expressive model and still achieve good or even better performance than what we would get if we were to use the more conventional kind of simple approach with regularization, et cetera. Okay, so with that, let's start with an example. So let's suppose we're flipping a coin um, a bunch of times, so n times. So we have this data set D of coin flips, which I'll just write down as Y1 up to Yn. We get to see, one sec. We get to see the outcome of each flip. So we see, for example, some sort of sequence that might look like head, tail, tail, head, 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 et cetera. And our goal is to try to estimate, in this case, the bias of the coin. So maybe there isn't really a 50% chance it'll be tails or heads. Maybe it's biased towards one or the other. And we would like to learn what the bias is so that we can predict the probability that the next flip will be tails. So let's let the probability of a given flip being tails um, uh, called, uh, we'll call that lambda. Um, and um, with that, let's um, write down our likelihood. Actually, this is a good kind of initial exercise. So um, last time we talked about creating a likelihood from an observation model for regression. Remember I said y of x equals f of x plus epsilon and epsilon is Gaussian noise. And then from that, we could say, well, y given the parameters that we were trying to estimate has a normal distribution. And then if we're conditioning on the parameters, all the data points are independent. So we end up taking a product of a bunch of different Gaussian densities. And then this gives us our likelihood and then we can optimize that or we could introduce a prior and find a posterior and optimize that. Or as I discussed at the very end of the last lecture, we could follow a fully Bayesian approach where the key distinction is rather than betting everything on a single setting of parameters, we're doing this Bayesian model average over all the different possible settings of the parameters and weighting them by their posterior probabilities. So my question to you is kind of a warm up exercise is what is the likelihood of our data set P, D, given, lambda. So just think about it for a minute. We've got N flips. Uh, let's make it simple. I'll say that there are M tails in these N flips that we've observed. What's the probability of observing that data set? 
So feel free to, to just write in the chat or unmute whatever you like. So this might seem challenging because of the, the language I'm using, like likelihood, et cetera, but this is kind of the first sort of problem you see in any intro to probability class. Um, you're flipping a coin. What is the probability of getting this sequence of flips? I mean, this isn't, I, I, I mean, uh, please don't be shy. So let's suppose we got two heads. What's the probability of getting that sequence of flips? So I said tails is, is that it would be quarter if, if there was a 50% chance. Although if the probability of tails is lambda, then what would we get? So P H H one minus lambda squared. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, so if we had something like P T H H, then we would say, okay, well, that's lambda times one minus lambda squared and so on. And now let's suppose we have M tails and flips. What have we got there? Right, okay. So someone is using this sort of YI notation and I guess you could let YI be one for tails and zero for heads. So we could sort of do something like this. Um, Lambda yi one minus lambda to the one minus yi, and sort of we're taking this product over n, and yi equals one if tails and zero otherwise. Um, and in general, if we just care about um, you know how many tails we get in n flips, then we can just use a binomial distribution and say, well, the probability of getting m tails in n flips is going to be given by n choose m lambda to the m one minus lambda to the n minus m. So that's the probability of getting that data set. Okay, so we have our likelihood. This is the likelihood we were looking for. And functionally, it'll be very similar to this, this uh, expression I've written with the product. Okay, now, now that we have this likelihood, um, what would be the maximum likelihood estimate for lambda? What is lambda hat, which equals arg max over lambda of p d given m lambda? So just take a minute and work that out. So we flipped our coin n times. We've observed m tails. And we want to know what is the lambda, this parameter that controls the bias of this coin, um, given by maximum likelihood estimation, what, what lambda will maximize the likelihood of our observations. So you might want to take derivatives and set things equal to, to zero. You might actually just see it already. I guess you would take logs and then take derivatives because maximizing the log m over n plus close, not quite. Remember n is the total number of flips. M over N, that's right, M over N. So I've flipped my coin a bunch of times, uh, N times to be precise, I've observed M tails and um, my estimate for the bias of the coin, the probability that I'm going to get tails is M over N. Do we think that's reasonable or unreasonable? Say one, if you think it's reasonable, two, if you think it's unreasonable. Hmm, okay, so it seems kind of reasonable. Now, let me phrase the question a bit differently. You've flipped the coin once. We observe tails. What is the probability that we're predicting the next flip will be fit tails? So we just plug in the numbers here. So M is one, N is one. Lambda hat is one. So using maximum likelihood, if I flip the coin a single time, 
and I observe tails, what is my estimate for the bias of the coin? And what am I predicting the coin will be on the next flip and with what probability? Tails, 100%. Correct. Right. So lambda is one in this case. Now, if I just, if we kind of stepped away for a minute and we hadn't already said that this looked reasonable, <laughs> we just, you know, use the men in black device and forget that. Um, and I said, oh, I've got this coin. It's biased. I'm not telling you how biased it is, but it is biased. And um, I want you to guess what the bias is. And then I flip it once and it's tails. Would you think it's reasonable to say, well, I'm 100% I'm sure that every flip after this is going to be tails. I'm very confident about the, the bias. And, and if I had to make a point prediction, I, I would say it's a 100% chance that it will be tails. Does that sound reasonable? No, I mean, it seems wrong, right? You might say, well, maybe we have big error bars. Like maybe we're saying lambda is one, but because it's a small sample size, we've got big uncertainty estimates, a big confidence interval or something like that. That, that might be true, but our prediction is still that lambda equals one. And if we had to make a guess using maximum likelihood about the probability the next flip would be tails, it would be 100%. So in fact, this is actually completely insane. And um, when we get an estimator that seems to really conflict with our beliefs in some intuitive sense, like guessing that the next flip will be tails will almost certainly be a bad guess, or at least if we're saying it's a 100% chance, um, uh, that usually means that our modeling procedure has not incorporated our honest beliefs in some way. So let's think about something else that we could do. So one procedure we could follow would be to first start by thinking about what prior beliefs we might have on lambda, the bias of the, the coin. So if we choose a prior that's proportional to lambda to the A, one minus lambda to the B, since the likelihood has the form N choose M, lambda to the M, one minus lambda to the N minus M, we see that if we multiply these two things together, that we'll get a posterior P of lambda given D with the same functional form as the prior. It'll also be of the form lambda to the alpha one minus lambda to the beta. Um, and so um, this is a, a special example of what's called um, a, a conjugate prior. So if you, have, if you choose a distribution for your prior such that when you multiply it against the likelihood, the posterior has the same functional form as the prior, and re recall that the posterior is proportional to the likelihood times the prior, then we have what's called a conjugate prior, and that's kind of convenient. And um, the beta distribution has this property. So um, if we choose P of lambda is a beta distribution, um, and it has parameters A, B, then um, it's equal to lambda to the a minus one, um, one minus lambda to the b minus one times a normalization constant. So it looks kind of messy, but all this is doing is it's guaranteeing that if we integrate over all possible values of lambda, we get one. So these are just gamma functions. Okay, so this is our beta distribution. And I'm choosing this because it'll be kind of convenient, but it turns out that it's also a very flexible distribution so it'll enable us to express quite a variety of different prior beliefs. We also can get the, the moments of the beta distribution in closed form. So the expected value of lambda would be a over a plus b, and the variance of our estimator for lambda would be a b over a plus b squared times a plus b minus one. Okay. All right, so let's see what distributions we can express with this. Uh, I'll just pause for a moment. There's a question. Don't such statements really only make sense when you use a large n to calculate lambda? Well, um, we'll explore that question, but we should be able to make predictions even if we don't have a large n because we just, we have whatever the world gives us. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if I just flip the coin once or twice, like let's say I said it flipped it twice and it's tails both times, it would still seem completely insane to say, well, I think 
that every subsequent flip is going to be tails. 100% chance it has to be wrong. Um, so um, yes, if we have a small n, then maybe we would have more uncertainty and so on. But this estimator is still sort of crazy. And um, we're given a finite n and we're having to make a prediction. And we can see that the maximum likelihood estimate is leading to us, leading us to a prediction that we don't believe intuitively. We think it's going to be wrong. It's biased. It's, it's overconfident. Um, we think that the real answer is probably going to be less than 100%. OK, so let's see how that's affected by expressing a prior belief. In many of these instances, when we get these sort of counterintuitive results, it's because we aren't fully incorporating our beliefs into the modeling procedure somehow. So if we set A equals B equals 1 in the beta prior, then we just get a uniform distribution over lambda. So that's basically like saying, I have no idea what the bias of the coin is a priori. So that seems like a reasonable prior. Um, we could alternatively use some other configuration. So if I put A equals two, B equals three, for instance, we get a distribution that looks like this, where this is 0 0.5. So it's a little bit skewed towards it being heads. Um, we might uh, believe that the bias um, is going to be in one or another direction, like maybe the way I've phrased the coin, maybe the expression I have when I tell you the question suggests that this is a biased coin. So maybe I want a prior that looks like this, like it's biased in some direction, but we don't know what direction. Or maybe we think that actually um, this is pretty much a normal coin. So, um, you know, the bias is going to be close to 0.5 in some way, but it might be something else. So maybe we want something like this. So this would be for A equals B equals 0 0.1. This would be for A equals 8, B equals 4. Or sorry, this is a different setting of A and B. So essentially, this, this beta prior gives us this, a, a really large amount of flexibility in um, in um, specifying you know, whatever prior beliefs we might have about this problem. And just to kind of reiterate, again, to get our posterior over lambda, which is what we would want to find once we specified the prior, we just multiply our likelihood and prior together. So here we have, for instance, our prior prior times our likelihood and that will equal our posterior. And we can write down, since uh, I said the posterior is going to be a beta distribution as well, because we've used this conjugate prior, exactly what it'll be. It's going to be beta, it's a distribution in lambda, and its arguments will be m plus a and n minus m plus b. So what we can do then is compute what is the expectation of lambda given our data set that we've observed. And it's just this first argument over the second. So we get n or over the, the, the two arguments added together. So we get m plus a over n plus a plus b. So now we can see what kind of prediction we get with various different priors that we might want to use. So let's suppose we go with the ignorance prior. We say we have absolutely no idea what the bias of the coin is. We don't want to say it's, it's anything in any particular direction. So we set a equals b equals 1. We flip the coin once, uh, we get tails, m is 1, n is 1. We see then that we get 2 in the numerator, 3 in the denominator. So we're saying there's about a 66% chance that the next flip is going to be tails. That actually seems a lot more reasonable. I think it would be hard to say that that's a crazy estimator in the same way it's easy to say that 100% um, is kind of a crazy estimator with so little data. Another sort of nice thing we get out of this 
is um, the ability to say, well, what is our uncertainty given how much data that we've observed so far? So um, remember we had this expression for the variance of lambda. So given D, it's going to equal uh, the first argument times the second argument. Um, so let's just go back for a second. So it's going to be um, m plus a times n minus m plus b over which will simplify to Okay, so we can see here just looking at this expression that is n increases, the number of flips increase, our uncertainty about the value of lambda decreases, which is you know, a desirable property. Um, we can also, in looking at the last slide, get a sense of what happens um, in the limit of lots of data versus maybe a very strong prior. So, if n is very, very large in this case, um, we can see that m is also going to be large, especially if we're talking about, you know, if n is arbitrarily large, even if lambda is small, m is going to be very large still. And so m will be much larger than a, and n will be much larger than a plus b. And we see that this estimate will converge to m over n in the limit of infinite data. So that means we recover the maximum likelihood estimate as we get more and more data, which is a general property of probabilistic modeling. And it's of course, exactly what we would want. Um, as we get more and more observations, we want our prior beliefs to have less and less of an effect on the predictions that we're making. We can also see that if we make A very large or B very large, that that could dominate the data. And when we look at this updated sort of posterior, for lambda, we can actually perceive A and B as pseudo counts of the data. So A is sort of like a, a pseudo count of how many tails we've observed before we even start the experiment and B the same for heads. And so that's actually really, really nice. And it also leads to this kind of online interpretation of Bayesian methods. So let's suppose I've done a few flips and then I form my posterior distribution. I can then start my experiment over again and use my, my current posterior now as my prior and then recreate my likelihood, multiply those two things together and I'll get my new posterior. And that would be the same, that will be the same posterior that we would get if we just combine all of our flips together and started with our original prior. So hopefully that makes sense. So the idea is kind of like, if we're sort of doing this experiment in an online fashion and we just want to retain kind of memory of the parameters that we're interested in, we can say, well, okay, let's, here's our posterior, given that we've done five flips, for example, and let's, you know, um, you know, do something else for a while. And then let's flip the coin a few more times. Uh, we can now start with our, our, our old posterior as our new prior. And then in our likelihood, we, we can only consider three flips. And then um, we've got our posterior, which is ultimately accounting for all eight flips that we've done. And so we can see how this kind of updates in a very kind of natural way. And this is often perceived as a kind of a, a nice advantage also of the Bayesian approach. It has this very natural kind of online interpretation. And um, I talked yesterday about the importance of model averaging and the distinction between model averaging and maps. So let's suppose instead we were doing optimization. So really in doing this prediction of E lambda given D, I'm doing a model average. If I'm trying to answer the question, what is the probability that the next flip is tails? Like we're taking lambda, P lambda given D, D lambda. So we're taking all the different values of lambda, 
weighting them by their posterior probabilities. So this is an example of a Bayesian model average. Um, the alternative that we discussed um, is to look at the log posterior, which is equal to the log likelihood plus the log prior, and optimize that. Now, here we see the prior appearing as well, but I'll ask you, let's suppose we use that uniform prior on Lambda, we use the ignorance prior, we don't know what the bias is, and then we optimize the posterior. What would be our estimator for Lambda if we've done N flips and we've observed M tails? What is arg max over Lambda of P Lambda given D for N flips, M tails, P lambda equals uniform, which equals beta A equals one, B equals one. Any guesses? Well, what was it for D given lambda? We already worked that out, right? I mean, so we already know what arg max over lambda of p of d given lambda is, right? In this setting, that's like how we started the lecture. We, we worked this out. We've already given the answer for this. What is it? There's no prior. We just wrote down the likelihood. We said we've got a binomial distribution. We're optimizing that with respect to lambda. M over N, right? Like that's exactly what we've already done. Let's go back. What is lambda hat equals arg max over lambda P of D given M lambda? It equals M over N, here's the likelihood. So we've seen that question before. Now I'm asking you a related question. Let's suppose we're optimizing the posterior instead of the likelihood. So we can write down the log posterior as equal to the log likelihood plus the log prior. And I'm saying, what is arg max over lambda of P of lambda given D? So let's look at this expression. Let's call this equation one. In the setting where P lambda is a uniform distribution, So if P lambda is uniform, what is the functional form of that? What does it look like? One over N close, I guess we just have, so lambda can only be between zero and one and it'll have a value of one if it's uniform there. So that's for a uniform distribution. And this is sort of uh, constrained optimization in the sense that lambda can't be anything other than something between zero and one. And so what effect will a uniform distribution on lambda have on trying to optimize equation one with respect to lambda? No effect, yes. So um, P lambda, if it's uniform, doesn't depend on lambda. And so uh, this is just a constant as far as our optimization is concerned. 
And so what will be our answer then for optimizing the posterior distribution? M over N, right, exactly the same as it was before. So argmax, it's going, the answer here is M over N. And why is this an interesting result? Well, I would argue that this is an interesting result because in one setting, we used a uniform prior, the ignorance prior, and we got a different prediction. That's when we did the full Bayesian procedure, where we did the model average. In this other setting, we're still using the prior, but we're doing optimization. This is regularized optimization. And we get exactly the same answer as we did with maximum likelihood, exactly the same pathology. So we could, in principle, choose some other regularizer that's maybe very biased towards, um, you know, it being uh, like, a, you know, biased towards heads or something like that. And that will affect our answer because that will depend on lambda. But the kind of the key point we're making here is that there's a, a, a significant conceptual difference between a full Bayesian procedure where you do a model average like we see in this integral versus regularized optimization using a prior. In the latter case, if we have, for instance, a uniform prior on our parameters, it's not going to affect our answer at all if we're doing optimization. But if we're doing a Bayesian model average, we do get a very different answer and we would want to get a very different answer because if we actually don't know what the bias of the coin is a priori like if we express that as a proper prior belief and then we flip the coin once and we see tails that shouldn't really affect our posterior that much we shouldn't be saying okay there's a 100 percent chance that every subsequent flip is going to be tails and so we don't get that behavior when we do the real bayesian model average we still get that behavior if we do optimization and we have that uniform prior. And so um, this is kind of a, 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 an example that clearly shows that we, we shouldn't be interpreting Bayesian methods as just giving us kind of like regularized training. Um, and that is kind of a common misconception, I think, about Bayesian ML, that basically we have some kind of prior and it's sort of like regularization and so on. There are ways in which there is an analogy between regularization and, and priors through map estimation, but um, the full Bayesian procedure um, is really quite different. And we can see examples where a prior will make a big difference in our predictions if we are doing the Bayesian model average, or as it won't affect our predictions at all if we're just doing optimization. Okay, any questions about that example? is a takeaway that we should always use Bayesian model averaging. I would say that um, there are a couple of takeaways. So one is that um, there is an important conceptual distinction between Bayesian model averaging and maximum a posteriori optimization. So where we're maximizing a posterior. Um, in both of those cases, we are using a prior. So that's why they're often kind of conflated. It's like, oh, well, Bayesian methods are all about a prior and maybe that's subjective, is that problematic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that um, really that's, that's not the real distinction here. I think that many non-Bayesian procedures in some ways are using priors. In fact, regularizers can be equated with priors in many cases. Um, the real distinction is the Bayesian model average. And so we often get quite a meaningful difference in our predictions. Another takeaway is that maximum likelihood is kind of crazy. Um, and uh, we see that with this example, there are many, many other examples where we just get kind of pathological behavior in our estimators when we're doing maximum likelihood training. And I think that's what's led to a lot of conventional notions of we shouldn't use models which are really flexible, for instance, because we'll then be doing um, kind of, uh, uh, we'll be overfitting and making poor sort of generalization, et cetera. Um, and so I think a lot of that is kind of an artifact of maximum likelihood when in fact maximum likelihood is often not what we want to be doing. And so this is kind of a clear example where using maximum likelihood leads us to a pathological estimator. And you know, if we had time, we could go through dozens and dozens and dozens of, of examples like this, um, where um, it at first glance seems like we get something sort of reasonable, 
but on further inspection, it actually seems um, you know, really quite different than what we would want. So the M over N, when I first asked about it, everyone said, well, this was good, right? It seems intuitive. The number of tails over the total number of flips is our, our estimate for the bias of the coin. But then on closer inspection, it actually started to seem a bit unreasonable. Um, and one might say, well, we didn't have enough data, but how much is enough data? And often we have to make predictions without an infinite amount of data. Um, okay, yeah, any other questions? Right, so that's a very good, it's almost like a plant that leads us to the next part of the talk. Um, so what is Bayesian deep learning? How do we do it? Um, why isn't everyone doing it? Okay, so um, in fact, you, you have the foundations for really understanding um, a lot of what we might consider if we were trying to deploy a Bayesian neural network rather than kind of a neural network that's been conventionally trained. Um, we said we um, follow this procedure where we start with our observation model. That leads us to our likelihood. We specify a prior. And then these two things lead us to our posterior. And then we form a posterior weighted Bayesian model average. So this is really all there is to Bayesian modeling. Now let's consider this model average in the case of a neural network. So we have, um, the distribution we're using to make predictions where X is an input, this is an output. So this could be like a class label or regression output or something else. This is our data. So we've got our integral of P of Y given X and our parameters times the posterior over our parameters given our data. So this is what we normally use to make predictions once we've learned our parameters W usually through maximum a posteriori estimation. And this is our posterior here. Posterior predictive distribution conditioned on W. Okay, so um, the reason I think that Bayesian methods are particularly important in deep learning is because often our neural network is able to represent many reasonable explanations for a given problem corresponding to different settings of its parameters W. And this sort of makes sense, right? Like neural networks are big, flexible models. There might be many different explanations to a given problem. The neural net is able to represent a, a big subset of those explanations. And so that's when we're going to see the biggest difference between doing this Bayesian model average and just doing classical estimation. So remember we said classical estimation basically just takes our posterior and treats it as a point mass around the maximum posterior estimate for W. So we can see that these two things will be most different when the posterior is actually pretty diffuse. And that's going to be the case with neural nets because of what I said, that there are all these different settings of parameters W which actually provide really nice explanations for the data. And so that's the reason we, we especially care about Bayesian methods in deep learning for some other model classes that maybe only have a few parameters and they're relatively speaking a large number of data points. Um, we get a pretty well-specified posterior and so it's not actually terrible to approximate it as a point mass. With a neural network, this is actually really um, kind of different um, and we will get a very different answer by following a Bayesian approach. And now, another thing that's also important here are having calibrated um, probabilities for our predictions. So. Um, 
let's actually consider it. We've been talking a lot about regression. And there was a question I saw in, at the end of Killian's lecture about how to kind of accommodate classification. Let's sort of kind of quickly step back and just think about an observation model for classification. So we've got our function f of xw, which could be a neural network. It could be, you know, whatever we want. So e.g. neural network, um, or it could look like sort of w transpose times a, a vector of basis functions, phi. So that could be like a polynomial model that we were considering, um, et cetera. Um, and we want to sort of, do classifications. Let's just keep it simple and consider, consider binary classifications. We have two different classes we're trying to predict between. We start by creating our observation model. So I'm going to say, well, what is the probability that we get a label one? Let's say we're considering labels one and uh, zero. So py equals one, given my function f of xw, I'll just say is a logistic sigmoid transformation of f of xw. So this is like what Killian presented when he was talking about neural networks and the logistic sigmoid is this function that's bounded between zero and one. So that means that p of y equals zero is just going to have to be one minus this. And then our likelihood, let's say we get some data points say in D, there's a bunch of different class labels given you know all the X's, which could be like the images that correspond to those labels. So that we can just sort of write out by saying, okay, well, if the label is one, then we want this observation model over here, equation one. If it's two or zero, we want equation two. So this is just gonna be sigma of F of X i W to the, yi times one minus sigma f of xi w to the one minus yi. All right, so there's our likelihood for binary classification. So this was just another example of kind of following this procedure to derive this objective that we want to optimize. One, I would say, more interesting feature of this objective is it's not as obvious as what we might want to be optimizing in regression, for instance, where we just say, well, let's minimize squared error or something like this. It's, it's not clear as we discussed that squared error would be great, but um, uh, uh, in classification, it's kind of even less clear what we would be you know, even starting with. And here we've got sort of a, a recipe that makes a lot of sense. Like we're just saying, okay, well, the probability that our label is one is gonna be some number between zero and one that's controlled by our function. And now let's learn the parameters of this function, the Ws, um, by formulating this, this likelihood and optimizing it. Okay, now if we maximize this expression with respect to our parameters w, what we find in practice, especially when we use neural networks, is that our predictions become very, very overconfident. So if, um, for example, I, I train this on a bunch of images and then I see a new image and I wanna say, what is the probability that this image is class label one? And let's suppose it's outputting you know, 90%. Really, it's more like a 70% chance that that image belongs to that class. And so this is actually a consequence, another kind of manifestation of overfitting. And the reason this happens fundamentally is because we're ignoring all of the uncertainty over the different reasonable values of W we might actually have. And we're kind of betting everything just on a single hypothesis. So that predictive distribution, that what is the probability of a new class label given some test input, which we'll call X star and our maximum likelihood parameters W hat, is kind of just assuming that the parameters are fully determined by the data. So assuming that the posterior is really just like a point mass around some setting of parameters. So we're throwing away all of this uncertainty that we have, especially in deep learning. And that's why these predictions end up being really overconfident, often called kind of miscalibrated. And so that's kind of a, another reason why we would actually want to do something like a Bayesian model average for big neural networks. So we'll get more accurate predictions, but we'll also get much more reasonable uncertainties. We can kind of more faithfully interpret the outputs of the model if we're doing classification as actual probabilities of class labels. Okay, so then the question is why isn't everyone doing it? Well, um, this is, you know, there, there's an interesting history. Um, so. In machine learning itself, neural networks have kind of come and gone over time. So they were quite popular in the 80s. Um, they kind of peaked in the mid 90s and then completely disappeared. 
And then they've, they've come back in the last 10 years or so. Um, in the mid 90s, around the time when um, neural net, nets were sort of reaching their peak of popularity, um, Bayesian methods actually were a gold standard for working with these models. So Radford Neal developed some um, very successful Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, kind of what are called sam MCMC sampling procedures for um, uh, providing really, really good performance um, with these, these model classes. Um, but a lot of those procedures don't actually scale to the really huge neural networks that we're using now. So I would say one of the, the main differences between neural nets in the mid 90s and neural nets now is the neural nets now are orders of magnitude bigger. So before maybe we were using models, neural nets with like tens of thousands of parameters. Now we're using neural nets very routinely with tens of millions of parameters. And so um, this means that um, the procedures that we need to follow to come up with a good estimate of this integral are going to have to be very different. Um, so let's see, this integral here, um, this Bayesian model average, is going to be extremely high dimensional because our parameter space W is very, very large. And not only that, this posterior has very unusual structure. And so we'll actually look at a few pictures of that. Um, and that being able to estimate this integral effectively involves trying to accommodate this unusual structure in the posterior, and also the fact that this is a very, very high dimensional integration problem. However, I think that sometimes people have been a bit too discouraged by these technical challenges. Yes, because of the dimensionality and the structure of the posterior, it is very hard even now to have a very accurate estimate of this integral. On the other hand, we have to think about what's the alternative. You know, it doesn't mean that we should then have a really bad estimate of the integral by doing maximum likelihood and just assuming the posterior is a point mass. And so sometimes, even if we can do a little bit better than that by saying, well, let's just assume the posterior is a Gaussian distribution instead of a point mass, we will often get big practical improvements in our predictive distribution. So I think sometimes this is sort of a trap that people fall into. If, if there appear to be sometimes issues with a particular procedure, um, it's tempting to drop that procedure entirely, um, but sometimes in favor for a procedure which is even much more problematic. And so I would argue that you know, even making small steps towards more faithfully estimating this integral um, are very worthwhile. And we see that, you know, they're better than, than the alternative in, in practice. But um, I would say also in the last year or so, there's been a, an enormous amount of practical um, uh, success in um, coming up with better and better approximations to this integral that also don't require very significant computational expense. Um, and we'll, sort of quickly discuss a few of these. So this is just a, a summary of what I've been describing for neural nets. Um, these are a few pictures where we've actually tried to examine the structure of these posteriors. So this is just a slice through uh, that really high dimensional space that the posterior is representing. And we're showing that there, there are kind of unusual topological properties like mode connectivity. So let's say you optimize P of W given D, and then you start with a different initialization, and then you find a different local optimum it turns out that there are subspaces along which these different optima are connected. So we can walk from one to the other without increasing the training loss along the way. So this is basically just to emphasize that this objective is very unusual and um, does contain a lot of low loss solutions. Okay, so here's a procedure that um, is actually very easy to use. It doesn't cost more than classical training and it provides pretty significant improvements in things like calibration. So the idea, is we start training with SGD as usual, but rather than decaying to a fairly low learning rate, we actually decay to a relatively high constant learning rate. And then we're just traversing a bunch of different parameter settings 
And what we do is we just come up with an empirical estimate for a Gaussian distribution that describes those parameters. So we assume that those parameters that we're traversing with SGD with that high constant learning rate are being sampled from a Gaussian distribution. And then we just take their empirical mean and a low rank plus diagonal empirical estimate of their covariance, just given by the equations at the bottom here of this slide. And that gives us an approximate Gaussian distribution for our parameters W in our posterior. And then we just form this model average. So it's actually, a bit, I mean, the whole, the whole method is basically on this slide. Um, we start by training with SGD. At the very end of the SGD training, we use the different weights that we're traversing, the different parameter settings, to create a Gaussian approximation for our posterior over our parameters. And then once we have that, we just sample from that Gaussian a bunch of times to approximate our model average. And so that procedure is called SWAG. Um, uh, and uh, this is in a paper called A Simple Baseline for Bayesian Uncertainty in, in Deep Learning. So this is sort of something that you can use and sort of immediately see better results than classical training. Now, we haven't- So um, I, I have a question. I have a question. Yeah, um, so this sounds very, very practical. Mm -hmm. um, but it, uh, does it in some way, in some limit relate to something more rigorous, like the full-blown Bayesian? Or is it like, you know, if you just commit to one um, network, you're really uh, over committing. So might as well explore a little and, mm -hmm. you know, average over them. Right, so it's a good question. Um, so as we take more and more samples, we don't converge to the full Bayesian model average. So that would be a distinction. Mm -hmm with something like Markov chain Monte Carlo, where in some asymptotic mm -hmm. limit, we would actually get the full model average. This is instead mm -hmm. saying, instead of using a point mass, let's just use a Gaussian to approximate right. the posterior. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so this is a, a fairly, there, I guess in approximate inference, there are often sort of two families of, of approaches, MCMC, which are asymptotically exact, and then mm -hmm. um, what are called sort of deterministic approximations. So these would include variational methods, um, something called the Laplace approximation, and this procedure that I presented here, where we instead say, let's use some other distribution that's more convenient to work with and have that mm -hmm. approximate the posterior. And so those mm -hmm. aren't asymptotically exact, but mm -hmm. often they perform better in practice than MCMC because mm -hmm. um, often the MCMC- it's more doable. You need to, you need to kind of run them actually for an infinite amount of time to realize mm -hmm, any of the mm -hmm, theoretical advantages. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. So, um, yeah, there's sort of a trade-off. So it's kind although, of in between. You know, exactly, it's kind yeah. Of in between. Mm -hmm. And this is based cool, on cool. a, sort of a, an idea that if we run SGD with a modified learning rate schedule, we are kind of like simulating a Markov chain that is, is a bit mm -hmm. like running MCMC. So in this, in this way, mm -hmm. it like um, does have a relationship with MCMC. And, we can see in practice that it improves things like calibration very significantly. So here we have mm -hmm. a bunch of image classification data sets and on the vertical axis, we're showing confidence, the highest kind of softmax output of our confnet minus the accuracy of using the corresponding class label to make predictions. And so a perfectly calibrated model would just be a horizontal line at zero and overconfident model would be above that line and an underconfident model would be below it. And we've just kind of thresholded for different values of confidence. And um, uh, we see that um, the SWAG procedure is almost a horizontal line in many cases. Um, the regular training is in green, I believe. Yeah, SGD, and we can see that that's pretty significantly overconfident. Um, and uh, we see that this is also running on really big neural networks and big data sets. So it's quite, it's quite practical in that sense. Um, cool. Uh, and so There's the last another question. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. Yep. There's a question from audience um, and students. Mm -hmm. Domenico is asking, um, can you recommend any reference that uses the language that you have been using today and yesterday? Yeah, so if you are to look at one reference, I would recommend this paper. Um, it sort of covers this opening question. It covers the sort of differences between the Bayesian and non-Bayesian approaches. And it talks about a variety of different um, practically um, successful approaches to, to Bayesian deep learning. Um, so I'll, I'll send these slides, um, but I would say this, this paper would probably be a good starting point and includes a lot of what we've discussed so far. Mm -hmm.
So one thing I would mention, so we haven't gotten a chance to discuss Gaussian processes yet, but, um, uh, and, and we'll just defer that, I think. Um, but uh, just to kind of give you a taste. Um, so uh, in terms of reasoning about model construction from a Bayesian perspective, it's, it's very useful to think in what's called function space. So quite often when we're doing statistical modeling, we're focusing all of our efforts on learning parameters W, and that's what I've been doing so far in these lectures. But in practice, these parameters are really just sort of nuisance parameters. We don't really care about them that much. They're not really that interpretable, especially if we're using a huge neural network, we have millions of them, et cetera. They're just a proxy for thinking instead about functions. And we do often have intuitions about functions when we're doing modeling. So we might have an intuition that our, our fit should be smooth or that it should be say quasi-periodic, or maybe there are some conditional independence properties, like maybe these two points are independent if we observe a certain number of points in between them and so on. And we can actually resolve a lot of these questions about model construction, having flexible models that don't overfit, et cetera, um, by thinking in function space. So if we imagine a straight line model, f of x equals w naught plus w one x, and we just put a standard normal distribution over the parameters, we can see that this will induce a prior distribution over functions. And we can visualize that by just sampling a bunch of times from this normal distribution and drawing out the different straight lines we get with different slopes and intercepts. And that's what I've I've done here. And we can use this perspective to understand model construction and generalization. So on the horizontal axis here, we have a conceptualization of all possible data sets. On the vertical axis, we have the probability that we would generate a data set under a given model class. So that's actually called a marginal likelihood or the Bayesian evidence. And with a simple model, like that straight line model on the previous slide, we're not able to generate very many data sets at all. But because the thing we're measuring on the vertical is a real probability density. It has to normalize. We're going to give those data sets a lot of probability mass. Whereas if we have another type of model, like maybe a huge fully connected neural network and a broad distribution of the parameters, maybe we can generate a wide range of different data sets, but by the same token, none of them have very much probability. We can imagine a third type of model in green here, which does have a lot of flexibility in the sense that it's able to express a wide range of solutions to a given problem, but it favors very strongly certain types of solutions. And so that's called inductive, having inductive biases. Basically the distribution of this support for different solutions are the inductive biases of the model. And models like convolutional neural networks have properties like translation equivariance. This idea, for instance, that if you translate an image that the class label should be unchanged. There are also all sorts of symmetries and I guess physicists like symmetries in, um, in, in, in many other data sets that we want to capture in these models like rotation invariance and things like this say if we're modeling molecules, or if we want to conserve um, some physical quantity like angular momentum or something like that, if we're predicting the, the trajectory of, of a particle. And um, we, can, we can do that. And by doing that, we create these inductive biases so that certain types of data sets are a priori more likely than others. And so in this figure here, we see how each of these three model classes respond to observing a given data set. So, the blue model, the simple model will be quickly constrained by the data, but it's kind of erroneously constrained because it doesn't actually capture anything like the ground truth in its support. So that would be like this, this, this example that I started with. And uh, we can see that there's this seasonal behavior, et cetera. If we go with the linear function, we're gonna miss all of that. So we're gonna collapse onto a function that isn't a good description of reality. The red model has some setting of its parameters, which actually does provide a good description of reality. But because it doesn't have very good inductive biases, a priori, it's kind of saying that these crazy solutions are as likely as the, the more reasonable solutions. It doesn't really efficiently contract around a good solution and it won't provide good performance. Whereas the green model casts wide enough of a net such that there is a setting of parameters that provides a good description of reality, but it also is a priori biased towards certain types of solutions that are aligned with the problem that we're modeling through properties like translation equivariance, also through properties in general of using neural networks, like having multiple layers, I would say is more about inductive biases, more about capturing things like hierarchical structure in data than it is about model flexibility. And so this is how we can start to understand a prescriptive approach to model construction towards good generalization that embraces flexibility and expressiveness 
um, uh, uh, rather than sort of tries to, to rule it out um, to avoid overfitting. Now, Gaussian processes are really special in that they specify the prior directly over functions. So when we're using almost any other model class, like say a neural network, we start with f of xw, we put a distribution over w, and that induces a distribution over f before we observe any data. With a Gaussian process, you actually directly specify the distribution over functions. And that is a very, very powerful formulation. And it actually allows us to work with models that even have an infinite number of parameters. And interestingly, these models don't overfit at all. And in many cases provide their best performance when we have relatively small data sets. And so that's kind of completely in the face of a lot of conventional statistics. You know, we're, we're not only using models with more parameters than data points, we're using models with an infinite number of parameters, yet we're finding we achieve particularly good generalization on problems with a small number of data points. And that is enabled through the inductive biases of these models, even though they're very flexible models, in fact, they're universal approximators, they have a very strong prior preference for certain types of solutions, and that enables them to efficiently contract around a useful representation for solving our problem. All right, so with that, um, uh, I guess that's the end of this lecture. Um, in the next lecture, we'll talk about um, more unsupervised learning, but I'll also talk a little bit about Gaussian processes. So we'll, uh, Killian will be talking about dimensionality reduction approaches like PCA and TSNE. I'll show how there's a probabilistic formulation for some of these approaches. And we'll also discuss another kind of popular approach in unsupervised learning called K-means clustering. And we'll see how that's actually a special case also of a probabilistic formulation for density estimation. Great, thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was um, really awesome. Um, okay, so now let's, uh, I wanna switch over to um, today's lead TAs. Um, Sane uh, is Andrew's student. She's going to be one of the lead TAs. And the other lead TA is Cole Miles, who's uh, my student. So let's see. Um, mm, let's, uh, can I make you a host? Do I know how to do that? Um, I don't know if Jonathan's around. Um, Sane, can you try to share your screen or is that not? Ah, good, okay. Okay, I'm able to. Good, very good. All right, so um, can you like in 10 minutes walk over the, uh, the notebook? Yeah, sure. Um, so after this lecture, I'm going to give you a feel of like what Bayesian linear regression looks like, the posterior distribution, the posterior predictive distribution, and also try to see how how Bayesian model conversion with a maximum a posterior resolution. So we, we're gonna start from the general case of a Bayesian regression model, but we're gonna reduce the dimension to um, three, to three to, to be able to code our posterior and to give us a feel of what it will be. So first of all, let's suppose a general um, Bayesian regression model, which would be written this way. We're waiting the, the input feature, uh, which is W here, and we're considering uh, the noise, which is here epsilon, and it follows the normal distribution. So here the variance we would have is sigma squared, and it's zero mean. And we're going to consider also a uh, normal prior over the weights, which here would have zero mean, and the, our covariance matrix is gonna be uh, isotropic, the covariance factor, so squared. And we're observing IID data, and uh, here X is going to be our design matrix, which means that it's gonna account for all, our, um, for all of our input features. And the posterior distribution here can be found using the base zero, which it, uh, so basically is proportional to the prior multiplied by the likelihood. The likelihood here is uh, a Gaussian distribution because as we can see here, the noise is following a Gaussian distribution. So if we attempt to take the mean, it's going to be simply XW and the variance is going to be the variance of the noise. 
And here we find that the posterior distribution is a normal distribution as well, with mu posterior is given following this form and uh, sigma posterior is, go is given following this form. So this, um, this factor here accounts for the, for the variance that comes for, from the data and the second factor accounts for the variance that comes from the noise uh, that we introduced here, which is a Gaussian noise. And same for the mean, it accounts for both factors. And if you want to get this expression, I include it here that only requires compute to complete in the square to get the correct arguments. And then we move to the posterior predictive distribution, which is basically taking the, the conditional distribution with respect to the weights and weighting it using our, uh, our posterior distribution over the parameters. So this is our posterior distribution that we obtained in the previous question. And we find there's also a Gaussian distribution. And here I included again a hint, which is that the easiest way to find this expression is to note that this distribution is actually Gaussian and to try to find the mean and the variance. But I can give a reference later if you want a more um, detailed proof of this. Now, in contrast, the MAP solution does not account for all the whole weights the way we do here. So here we're accounting for all the distribution over the weights. Whereas the MAP solution is going to focus on a single setting that does maximize the posterior density. So here the posterior density, as we've seen previously, is a Gaussian distribution. And it is that the, that the maximum value for this Gaussian distribution coincides with the mean. So the MAP solution here is simply the mean of our posterior. And here, let's take a simple example, which is a polynomial example, where we have, uh, where we take into account count x and x squared for the input features. And the noise, as we considered before, is a Gaussian noise. So here we're going to consider the same uh, prior over the weights, and we're going to implement uh, the different parts of this. Uh, of this. So first of all, we, we want to be defining our, um, sorry, th there is a background noise. I wonder where it's coming from. Mute yourself, please. Thanks. So we're going to define sigma squared and tau squared. This also define a bunch of, uh, of points or data points uh, that we're going to use to design our design matrix. So we're going to take into account um, a, a vector of ones, which here is going to be applied by W0 to account for this constant term in as well x squared. And we're going to compute the posterior distribution using the expressions that we have above. So we define the posterior mean, uh, the posterior covariance, and finally the posterior distribution to be a multivariate normal distribution. This is uh, all of these uh, things are possible thanks to the stats uh, package from sci fi. So let's execute this. If you find any problem with the execution, you can let me know. And um, we find the, the posterior mean here, and we also compute the posterior covariance function. Now, we are going to focus on one uh, set of weights, which is the set of weights of W0 over the domain minus 2, 2. So we're going to see how our posterior distribution relates to our prior distribution. Um, we consider our prior distribution, which is using a mean of 0 and a, a covariance of 2 squared. And we consider the, the the prior density and the posterior density. So here, as you can see, for the prior distribution, we are um, we consider that we don't know much about the data. We are obviously introducing our tool, which which gives us an idea about the variance. But um, you can see that there there isn't a strong difference with respect to a set of parameters for this parameter w zero. Whereas the the posterior distribution. Um, is more concentrated around a single point. And as we see, distribution is a Gaussian distribution. So naturally, its, its peak is actually the mean, which is the map solution. And the more data we get, the more we're going to see that distribution is more concentrated about around this point. So I saw in the question someone asking about how much data we would need to see that the posterior distribution is contracting. So here we introduced. Um, we introduced the six or seven input points, and we can already see that the posterior distribution is already contracting around the true W0. And um, here, what we want to do is visualize some functions that are simple from the posterior to have an idea what the posterior distribution would look like. 
So we sampled 20 vectors from our zero distribution with respect to W0. And we also want to plot the maximum zero resolution to see how the samples would be different from the map solution. So here we create 100 test points and um, we create our design matrix for the test points as well. And here we are plotting basically the map predictions, which are in the bold blue, the samples, which are, are in the light blue, and also we see the training data. So we see that the map solution of or see one, um, one uh, possible sitting. And this is what you get for the predictions, but the samples look different. They do coincide more uh, for the training data or around the training data because we have information there. Whereas you see that they are more different towards the regions where we don't have trains. They don't have to agree. And this is intuitively, this is what you want. If you don't have information about a region of the space, you don't want your models to agree about that because you don't know what the, what the right information is. And I think next is we are going to look at the posterior predictive distribution the way we defined it above, because we obtained the, the closed form posterior distribution. So we're going to plot that. And we're going to try to see how, uh, how that looks like while accounting for uh, some variance, which is minus two standard deviations. So we're going to use this expression First of all, let's define the posterior uh, predictive distribution standard deviation. And we're going to take the map solution, which is the mean plus minus two standard deviations. And here we can see that this confirms the intuition we were able to build from the samples. Around the training points, we have less uncertainty because we have more information. As we get away, we are less certain. So you see here that uh, certainty grows larger. The question now, what happens when we observe, observe new data? Intuitively, um, intuitively for us, if we observe new data in a region of space that we don't know much about, then we should see that this uncertainty actually becomes smaller because now we have more information about that region. This is why we're going to introduce a new point in minus nine, which is a region where we have a lot of uncertainty. So we define again the input data to include that point minus nine and the corresponding y is 18. We, uh, we make our design matrix again and we define the posterior distribution again using this new data set. And you can see here what happens. Basically, we can see the difference with the previous plot. We still have the same behavior around the training input initially, but now because we introduced the new train minus nine, we see that our uncertainty is less because now we have more information. Now, thinking more about uncertainty from a map solution point of view, we would like to see if we take, again, the mean plus minus two standard deviation, what would happen for that solution? So here we plot the map solution and uh, the shaded area vision uh, is not coming from the Bayesian approach, but from the map itself. And we see that with respect to the new point, we see that we don't have a lot of uncertainty, but we also see that in there, we don't have a lot of information. The map solution is still giving us small uncertainty. And this is what Andrew was talking about, is that these approaches don't account uh, properly for the large variety of uh, settings that we can have outside our zone of knowledge. Here we don't have a lot of information, but still the map solution gives full and uncertainty to that we have a lot of information. So as we move away from the observed data, we see that the uncertainty for a Bayesian approach would increase, whereas it would almost take very Feel free to ask me questions. I'm going to be around and uh, to ask also about references if you need them for the proofs above. Grace and A. Okay, now uh, we're going to switch over to Cole. Um, Cole Niles, are you around? Can you share your screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so my notebook is going to focus on um, actually trying to apply some of these techniques to 
quantum like data. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to uh, present in this notebook is, is sort of dependent on um, knowledge that was introduced in John Yu's notebook yesterday. So if you uh, weren't feeling super solid about that, then um, feel free to like re review that notebook before working on this one. Um, but the idea here is basically to come up with something that looks like a very shallow CNN, convolutional neural network, um, that we can try to open up and understand what it's doing when it's, uh, when it's learning on quantum data. And so the general setup of the problem that we're going to have is um, imagine that you have some 2D quantum state. You have a collection of 2D quantum states. And I make a bunch of projective measurements of each of these states. Um, so in, in this notebook, we're going to be considering three different states. We're one where you can imagine. So um, imagine I have a 2D system and I have a spin on each site. Uh, one state you can make is that, OK, each spin on every site is going to be completely random which is uh, the snapshots on the left. Um, another one that we're going to look at is, okay, well, we're gonna uh, simulate a anti-ferromagnetic Heisenberg model. So the nearest neighbor spins are gonna interact anti-ferromagnetically at some finite temperature. And then you can make projective measurements of that state. And that's what these snapshots look like. Um, or you can imagine, oh, I have some kind of stripey state with some noise on top of it. And then imagine projective measurements from that state look like this. And uh, the question we want to ask is, how can we uh, build a model that discriminates between all of these uh, projective measurements from these different states, but actually be able to understand what it's looking at to identify, identify all of these? Um, and what we're going to sort of take advantage is that in all of these, the examples that we're presenting here, uh, because the interactions are local and nothing super weird is happening, um, we can really look at really small scale local patterns to be able to tell all of these snapshots apart. And so this notebook is gonna introduce something called a uh, correlator convolutional neural network, which is, you can think of as like a shallow CNN. So we're gonna do one convolution, um, but we're gonna use very specially tailored nonlinearities so that we can understand exactly what the features we're building are. Um, and it's a bit, I also noticed as I was going through, so I, I explain here uh, like what these nonlinear functions that we're uh, building are. Um, I've also linked to the paper up here where you can kind of find in depth detail about all of these steps. But the basic idea is, right, take a normal convolutional neural network, which is what this image looks like. Um, and we're really gonna chop at one convolution and I noticed as I was going through this notebook that the um, some reason one of the images isn't rendering correctly on Colab, but it is in the same folder as the notebook. So I'm just going to pull up this, and you, you should be able to see this also. Um, so imagine I have some snapshots where our snapshots don't have this this third whole channel. We're going to use some convolutional filters and do one convolution, and we're going to do a series of nonlinearities on that resulting map. And each of those maps, we're just going to spatially average to build basically these features here. Um, and the nice thing about the, the architecture is that each of these features is directly interpretable as measuring some collection of uh, multi-point correlation functions. Um, and the details of all this should be listed in the notebook, and you can step through it. Um, but the core idea at the end is that because all of these are interpretable as correlation functions, um, if we just connect all of them to the output with some weights, we can look at those weights and figure out what correlation functions are being measured to determine which snap, which state the snapshot came from. Um, so the notebook is pretty thorough and is going to step through how to train one of these to identify between these different snapshots. Um, but then there's a second step. Um, so the, this is what you should see from, from training. Um, and, but then there's a second step, which is, okay, we, I need to figure out which of these coefficients that are connecting each of these uh, correlation functions to the output is the most important for, for determining. Because you imagine if I, if I end training, they're probably all going to be non-zero, and you're, you're going to have some difficulty figuring out, okay, well, which of these do I actually really need to tell the snapshots apart? Um, and so what we're going to do is something called uh, regularization path analysis. 
Um, so this goes back to um, this is in previous lectures, descriptions like of lasso and other um, regularization techniques, where what we're going to do is um, at the end of training, we're going to basically hold these filters fixed and keep those frozen. Basically, everything in, the, in this architecture is going to be frozen except for these last weights connected to the output. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to retrain uh, these last set of weights, but we're going to do it under uh, a lasso penalty that, oh, I'm going to add to the loss some uh, hyperparameter lambda times the L1 norm of these weights. And the idea is if you start this lambda very, very strong, uh, then all of the weights are going to be off. And it's going to do terrible before, at classification. It's going to get like 50% classification accuracy. Um, but if you very, very, very slowly turn this lambda down, then at some point, only one coefficient should fire. And you should be able to see one coefficient firing and some jump in, in performance. And so this lets you get very sparse models, the end that you only need to look at a, a small handful of features to be able to figure out what's going on. Um, and for these models, these states that we're looking at, because they're relatively simple, um, we should hopefully find is that the beta that corresponds to two point correlation functions should be the first thing that activates when lambda gets uh, small enough. And it should essentially give you 100% accuracy with, with only one number. Um, right, so you can, you can step through this notebook and see all of the details of all the steps I outlined. Um, but this is the general idea. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me. OK, great. Thank you so much, Sane and Cole. So everyone, um, there's uh, 48 of you. Um, I guess, including the TAs. So we are now going to go back to gather town and um, stroll over to the classroom. And um, the idea is if you go to the classroom, you can grab a table and sit down. There should be plenty of seats. And um, you can start playing with either of these notebooks. Uh, we have a couple more TAs around. Um, Peter Cha and Michael Matty are two additional TAs. And I apparently did not, uh, yeah, so, um, and um, the, uh, the TAs are, the, all of the TAs will be available to answer your questions or help out, whatnot. Um, you can raise your hand using the gather um, reactions. And if you raise your hand, the TA, you know, one of the TAs will walk over to your desk and then they enter your private area where they will be able to have discussions with you one-on-one -on -one, and you can share your screen to them and the TAs can share their screen to you and um, you can say, well, you know, what is going on in this part of the notebook? You know, uh, what happens if I change this? Why, why am I breaking the code if I do this? That kind of thing. Also, you can send questions to the TAs directly through the chat to the participants within the gather town format, okay? Um, so um, finally, uh, I will... Uh, finally, we will later after, so the TAs are going to be around for maybe, uh, we're now at 11.35, so maybe for half an hour, um, that would make a total of an hour commitment. The TAs are going to be around for half an hour. However, we will uh, send you the email addresses of the TAs, the, uh, especially the lead TAs, so uh, the authors of the notebooks, so that if you have any questions, you can email them and ask afterwards. Okay, so I, I hope you get to have fun with these notebooks and I will also join you in the classroom um, and you know, facilitate uh, discussions and participation. So, all right, I'll see you all in the gathering.